as of the time this video is coming out, it's somewhere around the middle of 2020. Considering this, I'm going to make an educated guess that sometime during your life, you've most likely stepped foot into a grocery store. Whether you're young and went with a parent or you do your own shopping with a spring in your step and a crick in your back, just like the rest of us old folks, I'm assuming you've laid foot inside the boundaries of a food supplier sometime in your life. And if this assumption is true, then I'm happy or mm, perhaps a bit disappointed to reveal to you that this video will be dealing with you personally. So hello everybody and welcome back to the channel. My name is Blair or the Illuminati. And today we're taking a look at the company commonly called Monsanto, though you may know them by a couple other brands that they very heavily influence. You know, things like Frito-Lay, Capri Sun, Kellogg's, and various other well-known and highly consumed brands. I hope that you understand that today we are tackling a huge beast. I would be willing to bet a lot of money that sometime during your life, you've eaten something produced by this hellish corporation. Hell, you probably eat something made by them by the week, by the day, maybe by every couple hours because their stuff is so prevalent and it's pretty much everywhere. Eating cereal for breakfast in the morning isn't slowly killing you, at least from this angle. Instead, this is the tale of corporate greed, deception, corruption, murder, and a hellish monopolization on technology that has the potential to save the world. So sit back, relax, and prepare to be angry because this is going to be one hell of a discussion. Let's get into it. Before I go on to ruthlessly hate on this company, which I will do, trust me on that, I first want to give you a brief rundown on the history of Monsanto and what it's done to warrant my ever-loving distaste. The Monsanto Company, originally known as the Monsanto Chemical Works, was established in 1901 by John F. Queenie. Queenie was a purchasing agent for a large scale drug company and the drug in question this time around was saccharin. Saccharin isn't a drug that you'll stoop over and it'll get you killed, but this is a synthetic sweetener that during the time was only produced in Germany. Saccharin is 300 to 500 times sweeter than natural sugar and therefore was widely sought by American companies specializing in sweet treats. To start the company, Queenie invested $5,000, $1,500 of his own money, and $3,500 from a local Epsom salts manufacturer. He decided to name the company Monsanto after his wife's maiden name. It only took a year before they were at full-scale production and four years until they started seeing reliable profits. This compounded quickly when Coca-Cola became one of their most reliable customers and their sales reached a million dollars in 1915 or about $25 million today when adjusted for inflation. Monsanto exploded during the First World War, its sales skyrocketing mainly due to the high tariffs based within the US. It was also during this time that John Queenie passed the reins for the company onto his son, Edgar M. Queenie and it was under him that the business grew into a corporate giant. It was renamed the Monsanto Chemical Company in 1933, and its production of stearine, a critical component of rubber, was very important to the war efforts of the Second World War. The company again changed names in 1964 to what we know it is now, the Monsanto Company. The latter years of the company are where it truly buys into the corporate nature of the chemical industry and where things began to get sketchy. They purchased a pharmaceutical firm in 1985, therefore gaining rights over NutraSweet, which they sold in 2000. In the 1990s, Monsanto purchased several biotechnology companies, including Calgene Inc. and DeKalb Genetics. These purchases put them at the forefront when it came to the production of genetically modified seeds, which there's a lot of controversy around this company for that very reason. Monsanto later began the production of BST, a synthetic supplement for dairy cows before it merged with a global pharmaceutical company in 2000. In 2002, Monsanto restructured its company and became publicly traded, focusing its efforts on agriculture and biotechnology. It furthered its goals by buying up several seed companies in the coming years. And that pretty much brings us up to today, where Monsanto, thankfully, no longer exists. I know it doesn't sound that awful yet, but just you wait. Their involvement in some horrible schemes is far more entrenched in the American dream than many may realize, and I hope to spread some light on the subject for you. For reference, by the way, the company no longer exists because it was bought by Bayer, and because of the many lawsuits Monsanto was facing, Bayer folded the company into its own crop and science division, dissolving it entirely. I know that a comprehensive business 
business breakdown might not be everyone's style, but you know how it is on the channel. And I feel it is truly necessary to understand where the company was coming from, how far it fell from its creator's original intentions and where it is now. I do, however, know that he was very active in his community and I doubt he would have wanted to see his company become the reason that so many people are angry, confused, or even dead. Monsanto has a dark history, my friends. And now that you know the lighter side of things, it is my supreme displeasure to introduce you to the darker side of this company. I'd like to start out this section of the video with a disclaimer. You should not be anti-GMO. No matter what scary things you've heard about them, I can assure you that GMOs typically don't have any adverse health effects. Think about it. We've been genetically modifying food for thousands of years by picking and choosing the best plants to breed together. It's only now that we've discovered a faster way to perform that and people are scared of it. So originally with its seed business, Monsanto was actually on the right track. When it tried to bring seeds to Europe, however, things backfired. And because the European people had just gone gone through a bout of food-based disease, the people were very wary of any food grown unnaturally. There's an article from modernfarmer.com that describes it pretty well. In 1996, the UK was reeling from the mad cow disease epidemic in which the British government insisted the highly dangerous disease posed no risk to human health while people were dying. Brits had gotten a fast education in the modern farm system and were primed to be suspicious of GMO's supposed safety. Although the seeds were approved by the European Union, consumers rebelled in England. Grocery store change pushed back, tabloids printed stories about frankenfoods, and environmental groups such as Greenpeace swung into action with high profile campaigns. Even Prince Charles, a longtime supporter of organic farming, wrote a newspaper editorial opening that genetic engineering takes mankind into realms that belong to God and to God alone. This reaction caught Monsanto execs off guard. As Dan Charles writes in his book, Lords of the Harvest, Philip Angel, the head of Monsanto's corporate communications at the time, bemoaned that the Brits were sad sacks of Europe for their suspicions of GMOs but Monsanto believed it could overcome the problem. The predominant attitude at the company was, if they don't like it, if they try to block it, we can sue them, says a former Monsanto employee who asked to remain anonymous when speaking to Modern Farmer. Monsanto responded with what was supposedly to be a cleverly counterintuitive $1.6 million ad campaign that read, food biotechnology is a matter of opinions. Monsanto believes you should hear all of them. The ads included the phone numbers of opposing groups such as Greenpeace, but the advertisements struck their audience as glib and insincere. Too little too late, Monsanto tried a different tack engaging in a dialogue with stakeholders all over Europe. Monsanto's then CEO, Robert Shapiro, even apologized for the company's condescension and arrogance at a Greenpeace meeting via video uplink in 1999. But the damage had already been done. Monsanto emerged from the bungled launch of GMOs in the UK looking like a bully and the image stuck. All right, so at the beginning of it all, this doesn't really look like it's Monsanto's fault. They tried to introduce a perfectly safe and harmless product to the people within the UK and those people recoiled against it heavily. Monsanto may have been a little bit over the line when they said they would sue companies for blocking their products, but even that isn't really a big deal compared to some of the stuff we're going to be looking into. The same article later describes one of the more horrible things that Monsanto got involved with, the Terminator seed. In 1998, Monsanto announced plans to acquire a seed company called Delta Pine and Land Company. Delta Pine had developed a patented seed that could only propagate once, the Terminator, as it was ingeniously dubbed by environmentalists could not be saved and replanted by farmers, forcing these farmers to have to buy fresh seed every year. Summoning up negative emotional responses to the Terminator was a powerful PR tactic the environmentalists in the British GMO debate, and it would only continue to be as the controversy caught on in the US. In fact, the seed proved to be such a hot potato that Monsanto never commercially introduced it. And yet the Terminator continues to live on in anti-GMO rhetoric. In the 2009 documentary, David versus Monsanto, about a Canadian farmer who was sued by the seed giant, more on this later, the Terminator seed is presented as if it's a viable Monsanto product. While the seed wasn't commercially introduced, I'm sure you can see just how terrifying this is. I'd like you to sit back and think for a moment. This company was prepared to launch and commercialize seeds that grow plants, but those plants don't produce seeds. I'd argue that producing seeds is kind of one of the main things that plants do, and the repercussions for taking away that ability are huge. Farmers who bought into the seeds would effectively be stuck in a loop of buying seeds, selling the crops, and then using a good portion of that money to purchase seeds again, all while they 
could be using plants that naturally produce seeds and therefore would only have to purchase seeds once. I won't pretend to be a farmer and I don't really have too much experience when it comes down to all of this, but I'm pretty sure that it's much cheaper to save and reuse the seeds grown on your own farm than to have to buy new seeds every time you want to plant a new crop. Again, they didn't actually commercialize these seeds, but their intention to do so puts a dirty mark on the company and their other seed-based controversies paint it even darker. You see, the odd thing about Monsanto is that they refer to their seeds as their technology, which technically, yes, the development and creation of new types of seeds can definitely be defined as a technological success. But my issue comes in when they make people behave like their seeds are a technological product. By not understanding, at least at first, the emotional dimensions of the debate, Monsanto has been unable to shake its image. By its own admission, Monsanto views its patented GM seeds similarly to the way the software industry views its proprietary technology. Like somebody buying a copy of Photoshop, Monsanto binds its customers to a terms of service agreement when they buy their technology. It includes stipulations such as the inability to save and replant the seed. In the past, if the company has learned those terms have been violated, they have been sued or threatened to sue farmers. Monsanto even has a hotline that people can call to alert them to patent infringements. Although this makes sense from a business perspective, it's problematic from a public relations perspective. The technology they're selling is seeds, which have rich cultural and even spiritual associations that Photoshop does not. Seeds have historically been a part of the natural world that belongs to everybody and nobody, like dirt or the ocean. The customers at liability risk aren't corporate IT departments, but rather farmers. The pitfalls of Monsanto's approach are most glaringly evident in the case of Percy Schmeiser, a rosy-cheeked Canadian farmer who was successfully sued by Monsanto in 1998 after he refused to pay the licensing fee for growing Roundup Ready canola. Schmeiser claimed that the GM canola seed had blown onto his farm by mistake and he wasn't infringing on Monsanto's patent agreement because he did not intend to use Roundup on the canola. Some of the crucial facts of the case remain hotly disputed. How much of Smizer's farm was planted with the GM canola, whether he knew exactly what he was growing and whether his claim that he wasn't going to use Roundup was truthful. But these murky areas get lost in the broad brushstrokes that color public opinion. Schmeiser was made into the poster child for the innocent farmer sued by Big Bad Monsanto. For the past several years, he's been a regular on the anti-GMO lecture circuit and the subject of the documentary, David versus Monsanto, helped paint the company in a very unflattering light. Monsanto does not appear chastised by this ferric victory. A page on the company's website describes the Schmeiser case in defiant terms. The truth is Percy Schmeiser is not a hero. He's simply a patent infringer who knows how to tell a good story. Monsanto is clearly a company that undervalues the power of storytelling. All right, so there is a lot to unpack here. First, I want to make it clear that I don't know whether or not Percy Smizer was lying when he said the seeds blew onto his farm. It does sound like an oddly suspicious story, but we can be sure that he didn't intend to use Roundup on the plants. Roundup, by the way, is the herbicide introduced by Monsanto that was widely linked to different forms of cancer. So take that how you will. In fact, just before Monsanto was bought by Bayer, they lost a lawsuit because of this particular weed killer. They were ordered to pay out $289 million because a man's cancer was linked to Roundup. And despite all of this, they still try to claim that Roundup is safe. Before they were even bought out, they intended to appeal. That's how sick this company is, because even when presented with fact and scientific evidence, they cling to their dollars and get away with it because they monopolize the food industry. But anyway, the farmer didn't intend to use the weed killer on his farm and therefore didn't pay the licensing fee to use Roundup Ready canola. So I'd like to dive into the intricacies of licensing fees for just a hot moment. According to Investopedia, the term licensing fee can be used in several contexts where it's most commonly used to describe an amount of money paid to an entity for a certain right or ability. A licensing fee can be an amount of money paid by an individual or business to a government agency for the privilege of performing a certain service or engaging in a specific line of business. Licensing fees can be paid for trademarks, copyright, or patents, among others. So now that we've got that out of the way, I'd like to propose to you the fact that I think it's absolutely absurd that a farmer should have to pay licensing fees to use seeds. I don't care if the seeds grow the forbidden fruit. I don't think somebody should be forced to pay a licensing fee after they've already paid to buy the seeds. 
Also, apparently Monsanto already has a stipulation in place where people aren't allowed to save and replant the seeds they receive from their harvest, so isn't that just astronomically wasteful? That means more work and money has to go into creating more seeds and the previously grown seeds have to be thrown out. And that seems kind of ridiculous to me. The way Monsanto handles the seeds physically, however, isn't the only problem with that sector of business. It also handles its patents and rights with an iron fist, which I suppose is their right, but when they're terrifying farmers with their antics, I think maybe they're just going a little bit too far. Vanity Fair reports on one farmer's experience with Monsanto's hellhounds. Gary Reinhardt clearly remembers the summer day in 2002 when the stranger walked in and issued his threat. Reinhardt was behind the counter of the Square Deal, his old time country store as he calls it, on the fading town square of Ingleville, Missouri, a tiny farm community 100 miles north of Kansas City. The Square Deal is a fixture in Eagleville, a place where farmers and townspeople can go for light bulbs, greeting cards, hunting gear, ice cream, aspirin, and dozens of other small items without having to drive to a big box store in Bethany, the county seat, 15 miles down Interstate 35. Everyone knows Reinhardt, who was born and raised in the area and runs one of Ingleville's few surviving businesses. The stranger came up to the counter and asked for him by name. Well, that's me, Reinhardt said. As Reinhardt would recall, the man began verbally attacking him, saying that he had proof that Reinhardt had planted Monsanto's genetically modified soybeans in violation of the company's patent. Better come clean and settle with Monsanto, Reinhardt says the man told him, or face the consequences. Reinhardt was incredulous, listening to the words as puzzled customers and employees looked on. Like many others in rural America, Reinhardt knew of Monsanto's fierce reputation for enforcing its patents and suing anyone who allegedly violated them. But Reinhardt wasn't a farmer. He wasn't a seed dealer. He hadn't planted any seeds or sold any seeds. He owned a small, a really small, country store in a town of about 350 people. He was angry that somebody could just barge into the store and embarrass him in front of everyone. It made me and my business look bad, he says. Reinhardt says he told the intruder, you got the wrong guy. When the stranger persisted, Reinhardt showed him the door. On the way out, the man kept making threats. Reinhardt says he can't remember the exact words, but they were to the effect of, Monsanto is big, you can't win, we will get you, you will pay. Scenes like this are playing out in many parts of rural America these days as Monsanto goes after farmers, farmers co-ops, seed dealers, anyone it suspects may have infringed on its patents of genetically modified seeds. As interviews and reams of court documents reveal, Monsanto relies on a shadowy army of private investigators and agents in the American heartland to strike fear into farm country. They fan out into fields and farm towns where they secretly videotape and photograph farmers, store owners, and co-ops, infiltrate communities meetings and gather information from informants about farming activities. Farmers say that some Monsanto agents pretend to be surveyors. Others confront farmers on their land and try to pressure them to sign papers giving Monsanto access to their private records. Farmers call them the seed police and use such words as Gestapo and mafia to describe their tactics. I agree that companies have a right to defend their rights and their patents, but I vehemently disagree with what Monsanto is doing in order to do so. I don't believe that employing shady mafia members to track down potential rule breakers is necessary when the product in question is seeds. Like seriously, I understand that Monsanto is protective over them, but come on. If the consumer buys them, it should be theirs to do with what they want. Isn't that how these things normally work? Some representatives of the company have tried to make the claim that their aggressive patent protection is akin to that of Microsoft with its Windows operating system, but I couldn't disagree more. Even if Microsoft sends out shady spies to track down people with fake operating systems, at least that's something that isn't morally gray. Windows is something that you pay for once and then reuse as long as you want. But with Monsanto, they're seeds. You plant them once. And apart from that, the people have already paid for them. That would be like Microsoft going to people's houses who have directly paid for Windows and saying, you have to pay us more to continue using this system. And that sounds kind of crappy, right? Well, that's because it is. Monsanto's iron hold over the seed industry was a hellish Time and it's good that it's over, but we shouldn't forget it. Letting a single company have such direct control over our entire food supply is something that I'll never endorse, but the direct monopolization of food isn't even the worst thing Monsanto's done. So buckle in everybody, cause next we're talking about death. 
I'm sure most of you have heard of Agent Orange, but for the select few of you that haven't, I'm sorry to have to burden you with this knowledge. During the United States war with Vietnam, an herbicide was dropped across the country. This herbicide, widely known as Agent Orange, was later proven to cause cancer, birth defects, rashes, and severe psychological and neurological problems. Monsanto was one of the two largest producers of this chemical for the US military. In order to understand why herbicides were dropped on Vietnam, I'm going to take you through what is known as Operation Ranch Hand. Please be advised, we're talking about war here. War is ugly, violent, and horrible. And if you're sensitive to death, mutilation, or other disturbing content, just know that that is what we are about to discuss. With that out of the way, Operation Ranch Hand was a program in which the US military sprayed over 4.5 million acres of Vietnam with herbicides, the most prominent of which being Agent Orange. This was done in order to destroy the forest cover that Vietnamese people were hiding within, as well as the food crops that were meant to feed the entire country. During this process, crops and water resources used by the non-combatant, non-violent citizens of South Vietnam were also hit. Of the 20 million gallons of herbicide dumped into Vietnam, 13 million gallons of that was Agent Orange. It was the most widely available and most widely potent. Why is it so deadly though? What makes Agent Orange so much worse than Agent Blue, Agent White, Agent Pink, or any other number of herbicides that were being used during the war? History.com explains it well in their article on the herbicide. In addition to Agent Orange's active ingredients, which cause plants to defoliate or lose their leaves, Agent Orange contains significant amounts of 2378, whatever the heck this word is, often called TCDD, a type of dioxin. Dioxin was not intentionally added to Agent Orange. Rather, dioxin is a byproduct that's produced during the manufacturing of herbicides. It was found in varying concentrations in all the different herbicides used in Vietnam. Dioxins are also created from trash incineration, burning gas, oil, and coal, cigarette smoking, and in different manufacturing processes such as bleaching. The TCDD found in Agent Orange is the most dangerous of all the dioxins. Because Agent Orange and other Vietnam era herbicides contain dioxin in the form of TCDD, it had immediate and long-term effects. Dioxin is a highly persistent chemical compound that lasts for many years in the environment, particularly in soil, lake, and river sediments, and in the food chain. Dioxin accumulates in fatty tissue in the bodies of fish, birds, and other animals. Most human exposure is through foods such as meats, poultry, dairy products, eggs, shellfish, and fish. Studies done on laboratory animals have proven that dioxin is highly toxic even in minute doses. It is universally known to be a carcinogen or a cancer-causing agent. Short-term exposure to dioxin can cause the darkening of the skin, liver problems, and a severe acne-like skin disease called chloracne. Additionally, dioxin is linked to type 2 diabetes, immune system dysfunction, nerve disorders, muscular dysfunction, hormone disruption, and heart disease. Developing fetuses are also particularly sensitive to dioxin, which is also linked to miscarriages, spina bifida, and other problems with fetal brain and nervous system development. And through all of it, there might be a couple people saying that they didn't know any better. There might be a few that think the herbicide idea would have been good if they had knew. But no, they did know. Dr. James Clary, an Air Force researcher who worked on the Operation Ranch Hand reported, when we initiated the herbicide program in the 1960s, we were aware of the potential for damage due to dioxin contamination in the herbicide. However, because the material was to be used on the enemy, none of us were overly concerned. We never considered a scenario in which our own personnel would become contaminated with the herbicide. And that's the nail in the coffin. The US military knew what was going on. Monsanto knew what was going on, but they continued to utilize Agent Orange against the Vietnamese people simply because they didn't believe it would have any effect on the American people. And boy, were they wrong. The soldiers fighting for America experienced effects as well, and some are still fighting against the cancers brought against them. I can't speak for the Vietnamese people. They were brutally tortured by the Americans, and it feels disrespectful for me to try and sum up what they went through in words. That still isn't the worst part of it all. Dow and Monsanto were kept in close proximity and talked openly about the chemical. They knew what each other knew, and there's evidence that they knew about the dangers of dioxin. What's worse, they knew how to remove it. A late 1980s investigation by Adam Elmo Zumwalt, a former commander of the US Navy in Vietnam and father of a naval officer who died following exposure to Agent Orange in Vietnam, unearthed evidence that the US military had knowingly augmented the defoliant's toxicity by spraying Agent Orange in concentrations six to 25 times the suggested rate. Other investigations of court and national archive documents have uncovered that the Agent Orange manufacturer Dow Chemical Company knew as early as 1965 that the dioxin 
contaminant in the defoliant was one of the most toxic materials known, and that as early as 1957, the company knew that dioxin could be eliminated by lowering the temperature and slowing the manufacturing process. But eliminating dioxin would delay production and reduce company profits when wartime production called for rapid, high quality manufacture. So they knew everything. They knew that dioxin was deadly. They knew how to remove it from their herbicide, but they didn't because it would cost too much to their bottom line. In instances like these, I truly understand why people say money is the root of all evil. I'm not a proponent for war. It's widespread and deadly and causes so many unnecessary casualties simply because a few politicians have their heads so far up their asses that they send other people to go fight their battles for them. And I am certainly not a proponent for using chemical weapons, which are directly banned by the Geneva Protocol, by the way. They were only able to get around it because it wasn't intended to be used as a weapon, just an herbicide to clear some plants. I don't agree with this because they knew it would cause harm to people, but I digress. This isn't an anti-war video, this is an anti-Monsanto video. This company was paid by the government to deliver an herbicide and they delivered a chemical bioweapon that happened to serve the same purpose. While the seed market manipulation and Agent Orange are the two main points against Monsanto that I wanted to focus on, I didn't wanna let them off that easily either. There are many, many other terrible things they've done. And while I won't highlight them all specifically, I still want to make you aware of the fact that this is a terrible company that has done terrible things. Some of these, however, do have plausible deniability, meaning I don't believe Monsanto always knew that its chemicals were terrible for the environment or for people in general. The first of these I want to focus on is the fact that they were the lead producer by a long shot in producing PCBs or polychlorinated biphenyls, which I probably butchered, but it's for use within electrical devices. These were highly toxic chemicals that were very easily able to leak into the environment. In fact, it is estimated that 50% of all PCBs ever made are now out in the environment. At the beginning, Monsanto couldn't have known how bad they were for the environment because nobody did. Everyone thought they were safe and that their use was fine within systems. The problem, however, rose when Monsanto did learn that they were dangerous. Monsanto continued to produce and distribute PCBs for eight years after they were deemed dangerous to the environment and to the general public. The Guardian has a good article on that, so let's take a look. Monsanto continued to produce and sell toxic industrial chemicals known as PCBs for eight years after learning that they posed hazards to public health and the environment, according to legal analysis of documents put online in a vast searchable archive. More than 20,000 internal memos, minuted meetings, and letters and other documents have been published in the new archive, many for the first time. Most were obtained from legal discovery and access to document request designated by Poison's Paper Project, which was launched by the Bioscience Research Project and the Center for Media and Democracy. Chiron Return contributed some documents to the library. Bill Sherman, the Assistant Attorney General for the US state of Washington, which is suing Monsanto for PCB cleanup costs potentially worth billions of dollars, said the archive contained damning evidence the state had previously been unaware of. He told The Guardian, if authentic, these records confirm that Monsanto knew that their PCBs were harmful and pervasive in the environment and kept selling them in spite of that fact. They knew the dangers, but hid them from the public in order to profit. As well as the Washington case, Monsanto is facing PCB contamination suits from city authorities in Seattle, Spokane, Long Beach, Portland, San Diego, San Jose, Oakland, and Berkeley. Any legal liabilities may be shared with the German chemicals company Bayer, which has mounted to 66 billion in a takeover bid for Monsanto. The European Commission aims to complete a competition probe into the merger by the 22nd of August, amid signs of public unease in Europe and in the US. Monsanto's vice president of global strategy, Scott Partridge, did not dispute the authenticity of the documents revealed in the online cache, but denied any impropriety. He told The Guardian, more than 40 years ago, the former Monsanto voluntarily stopped production and sale of PCBs prior to any federal requirement to do so. At the same time, Monsanto manufactured PCBs. They were a legal and approved product used in many useful applications. Monsanto has no liability for pollution caused by those who used or discharged PCBs onto the environment. And doesn't that feel just a bit slimy? Especially that last quote. I mean, sure, technically, I guess they were a legal product to manufacture, but after you specifically know that these chemicals seriously hurt people, isn't it your duty as a producer to stop producing that? Shouldn't you be making things that don't directly hurt people? That's my opinion anyway. It typically seems that the capitalistic tendencies of our great nation outweigh the moral compasses people feel. 
PCBs have been called probable carcinogens in humans, meaning that while studies haven't shown that they cause cancer in people, they are known to cause cancer in various different types of animals. They are also heavily linked to birth defects and PCBs can be passed from mother to child through breast milk as well. These are horrible chemicals, and the fact that the company continued to produce them is disgusting to me. Moving on from PCBs, there's another section of Monsanto that hasn't done its due diligence in the past couple years. This part of the company's failure is specific to India in that the production of BT cotton has been both a blessing and curse to the Indian people. It was supposed to allow for easy to grow cotton that was pest resistant, and the same type of cotton has done well and flourished in other countries. In India, however, there have been a select few problems. Mainly, apparently, the gene that helps prevent pests itself is not working correctly. Cornell University has done a report on this, and their report states the following. To be fair, the Bloomberg piece does admit that the apparent failure of BT cotton is unique to India. Other BT cotton growing countries, such as Australia to China, seem to have been able to manage the evolution of resistance in cotton pests. Something is therefore awry with Indian agronomy. To figure out the specifics, we reached out to BT cotton experts here at Cornell University. According to Dr. Herring, author of numerous peer-reviewed papers on the impacts of BT cotton in India, the pink bollworm is a real problem, albeit till recently isolated in India. However, when questioned about the reported problems identified in Bloomberg, article, Herring said, I'd first want to rule out counterfeit seeds. He noted that fake GM seeds are a huge problem in India and that there have been large scale studies showing farmers who thought they were growing BT cotton had gin derived varieties with little to no expression of any BT gene. Herring also pointed to changing cultivation practices, suggesting that BT cotton in India might be a victim of its own success because farmers are abandoning the recommended rotations of a second crop, which can be less profitable than the cash crop option. In some areas, cotton has become essentially a perennial crop picked continuously, Herring said. However, there are implications of this practice. The longer you leave cotton in the field, the more likely the pink bollworms will show up. He thought that restoring rotations in order to break the breeding cycle of the pest might well help. I don't know exactly what goes on in India, but I can't confirm that the farmers don't follow advice, but I do know that Monsanto is well known for being slimy in all the wrong ways. Would it really surprise you if they sold a poor region of the world defunct crops, knowing very well they wouldn't do much to push back? Because it wouldn't surprise me in the slightest. Now, if any of you have done research into this topic, you've probably heard the 300,000 farmer suicides in India over BT cotton myth. And I want to make it clear to you that it's just that, a myth. BT cotton is actually an incredible product that will do wonders for the world if it can be used reliably, but that's the problem with Monsanto's implementation. It wasn't done reliably. The people of India still experience pests, lower crop yields, and overall general crappiness when it came to the product. Whether it is intentional, I can't say for sure, but I can tell you that the suicide rate for Indian farmers isn't higher than any other country. There is a certain level of fear mongering that goes on around GMOs. And I want to clarify again that they aren't a bad thing. Monsanto is. Genetically modified food might sound scary, but there isn't any evidence that it hurts people. We've been genetically modifying for a very long time and I don't want any of you to carry around misinformation. Monsanto is the reason for a huge part of the black mark on GMOs, which is just another terrible part of their legacy. So with that, I'd like to bring this video to a close. I know this has been a heavy topic and for that I apologize, but I don't want you guys to walk around with any misinformation. Monsanto was a horrific company that has thankfully been dissolved, but I don't know much about Bayer, the company who bought it, but I can only hope that they're better than the monopolistic hellscape that they did buy. But guys, in all seriousness, don't be afraid of genetically modified food. It's going to save the world in some ways. The introduction of larger harvest, pest resistant genes, and other wonderful additions means that we'll be able to get food to more people at a cheaper price. I suppose we do have Monsanto to thank for part in that, but in my opinion, the bad outweighs the good by a lot. So with that being said, that's where I'm going to end today's video, but let me know your guys' thoughts in the comment section down below. What do you think about the brief history of Monsanto? If you guys enjoyed today's video, make sure to hit that like button. If you guys are new to the channel, hit that subscribe button. And if you guys want more content from me, you can pop open that description box. You're gonna find links to all of my social media, second channel for my puppy Casper, collaboration channel with Sad Milk, and links for like all my social media and like literally everything down below. So again, thank you guys so much for making it to another video. I love you so much and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.